All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation around the workflows powered by Apache Cassandra. My name is Maciej Świderski, and let's get started. So very quickly about uh, myself. So I'm an independent software engineer and consultant. I'm really big enthusiast of the workflows, as you will see over, over this presentation. And I'm in the fields of workflows and business automation for more than 15 years now. I'm as well a creator of the Automatic project. That's an open source uh, workflow automation that I'm going to use for demonstration today. And I occasionally write blogs and tweet uh, about main workflows and <clears throat> a bit of uh, software development there as well. So let's get started. And since the presentation is around the workflows powered by Apache Cassandra, so let's get started very quickly a bit uh, of uh, theory with uh, with workflows and <clears throat> how they can be exposed. So workflows uh, look at the business logic from end to end rather than individual fragments. Uh, so workflows are usually used to define business needs and business requirements when building applications. So in many cases, uh, I, I guess many of us actually try out like the whiteboard <coughs> flow chart kind of uh, diagramming uh, to better understand the requirements and so on. And the workflows can be actually exposed in a, uh, defined in a different uh, format. Uh, and the most common ones are the graphical one, like uh, for instance, BPMN, that stands for business process modeling and notation or the declarative one, like for instance, the serverless uh, workflow or the step functions, or even the Jenkins file or GitHub actions or uh, declarative uh, workflows. And uh, workflows bring uh, quite few benefits out of the box. And among many of those that uh, we can enumerate, I would like to bring up for your attention a few of them. And the first and the foremost, in my opinion, is the visibility. And the visibility is not about uh, business and IT alignment that it was uh, back in the days presented as the uh, yeah, silver bullet for, for workflows. It's more for the folks that are actually working on a daily basis with the given service or application. And that is to let them better understand the logic behind the service or application or better <coughs> grasp uh, very quickly the anomalies and needs uh, for change. So for instance, if you would like to apply or extend the service or application based on the workflows, it's uh, it's supposed to be easier to look at the definition of the workflows to, to get the better understanding. The next thing is the, the isolation. And I mean by isolation, the, the data and the, the actors involved in, uh, in the workflow execution, because workflows uh, can be defined as two things. One is the workflow definition, which is sort of a blueprint. And then is the workflow instance that is an instantiation of the definition for each uh, incoming uh, operation that uh, that would like to start processing the, the logic defined as the workflow definition. Next thing is that this around the data and data contract because uh, workflows are in the end all about altering data. So any kind of data, it could be a structure or unstructured data, but in the end it gets input and produces the output and how many steps are required to actually go from beginning till the end. It's really dependent on the use case, but in the end, they actually modify and alter the data. So with workflows and modeling of the business logic as such, you have the options to actually properly scope the, the data and the, with the means of considering the uh, classification of the data, like the, this is an input, this is an output, this is an internal, this is a sensitive data. So you can actually have a very well structured information about the data the, the workflow is dealing with. And by that, the business that are uh, <coughs> defining the business entities. And last but not least, the integration with outside world. It's like the workflows themselves will not live in isolation, complete isolation or self-contained, right? So they will need to talk to external systems and either by explicitly invoking them or by producing uh, events and uh, so possibility to rely on well-established integration technologies is a key factor for success with the workflows. So let's have a look at how workflows can be actually exposed. So it's the uh, definition of the workflow is one thing, but what we can do with that in the automation side. So I would like to bring up three types of workflows uh, that can produce something that is actually runnable. Uh, so first is the workflow as a service. This is like a, the most traditional approach. So the workload definition is uh, modeling the business logic, and then it is transformed into a domain specific API as a service. And that API is usually equipped with uh, 
endpoints that are usually accessible through HTTP or REST. It has a proper and comprehensive documentation in the form of open API. Uh, it takes advantage of the various integration, integration patterns and mechanis mechanism uh, to interact with the external world. So be it like uh, calling the REST endpoints or sending a message or receiving an email and so on and so forth. Plus uh, the ability to either have uh, option to deal with the short lived instances or long lived uh, or long running instances. And that means that the instance can span from seconds or milliseconds up to like months and years. And workable as a service as such is not really different from like a, any, any other developed service. Like you can use any framework that uh, allows you to expose things over uh, HTTP and REST that will have the documentation and so forth. So it follows the same principles, but the advantage it provides is the ability to use well-established and known work languages such as BPMN as a programming language. Uh, so that is maybe a bit of a contradiction uh, or tough to swallow, so to say, but those work languages can actually become a programming language. Obviously very limited uh, to some extent, just following on the, the principles of the modeling aspects themselves but can delegate a lot of uh, heavy lifting to the more sophisticated tools and frameworks. So next thing is the workload as a function. And here is, uh, it's more dedicated for short lived operations. Uh, and that usually spans from milliseconds to seconds at most. Uh, and they are expected to be fast and small, both uh, in size at runtime and at boot time. So it needs to, uh, scale up and down very quickly. So it more in most of the cases, it targets uh, deployments in a more constrained environment, such as for instance, AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Run or Azure Functions and those kind of things. Uh, however, it's not strictly limited that because in the end they will expose an endpoint over HTTP that can be invoked uh, either with uh, POST or GET depending on the data that you wanted to pass it to. And that pretty much makes it deploy deployable virtually anywhere and regardless of the number of activities the workflow has uh, it will always be exposed as a single function so it's expected to be like straight through so it will perform a certain operations depending on the data it receives and, com and completes uh, immediately as part of the function call and last is the workflow as a function flow and that is more advanced extension of the uh, workflow as a function which breaks the workflow into many different functions and here is a slightly more advanced approach because the elements that become functions are so-called single executing activity. And those are like, for instance, here, what we can see on, on the <clears throat> diagram is the function A that actually has a service rest A that is actually the service that is performing operation and has a, a possibility to, to, to alter the data of the workflow instance and as such becomes a function. But ex uh, next to the executing activities, there might be activities that are not performing the actual work, so to say, but are certainly of big importance. So for instance, the start and end events that uh, designate if it's a start of the workflow or end of the workflow, or is it a gateway, meaning at the condition logic, not a control logic. And this is kind of combined into the same part of the uh, the same function, so it can uh, quickly uh, decide on the next call. So this is what is important here is a function decides what is the next function to be invoked based on the state of the workflow and the information it has in its context. So regardless of the uh, characteristics of the service uh, and expected behave, behavior at the runtime, being service function or function, so, uh, Workloads can be classified into two categories. So it's either stateful or stateless. Uh, stateful means that it must maintain the state of each instance independently. So it can be resumed at any time. <clears throat> In other words, it, it is expected to be long lived. Uh, each instance must be uniquely identified so it can be easily restored and so on. It usually applies to the workload as a service and workload as a function flow because then we have the options to have to support the long lived uh, instances. On the other hand, the stateless approach is targeting the use cases for short-lived uh, instances, and that's usually not required um, uh, storage uh, storage mechanism at all. And in many cases, it's fast enough and uh, full-tolerant enough to avoid 
potential downtime, or it can simply be retried in case it fails at a particular place. Uh, in this case, the status, we don't need to have all the features available and mostly those that are related to state uh, <clears throat> will not be applicable. But uh, in most of the cases, the status approach ap applies to the workload of function and workload of function falls, falls straight through uh, instances. So as mentioned uh, before, stateful uh, workloads must have a data store of some kind uh, to be able to persist both instance state and data. And this actually bring us to Apache Cassandra, highly distributed and fault tolerant uh, data store. The main ca characteristics of Apache Cassandra are an excellent summary of what workloads solutions are all about. To be able to access instances of the workload at any time and pretty much anywhere. It's one of the most commonly heard requirements around the workloads, uh, but certainly not limited to that. Uh, in today's world, we're pretty much everything becomes more and more distributed, possibility to operate on a global scale is a must. And, and both systems and actors are located around the globe. Uh, those expectations that are that those actors and systems have on the, <coughs> the Novaday systems is actually accessible from anywhere at any time. And that project Cassandra delivers exactly that thing. The data are replicated around, <coughs> around the ring that can span across geographically distributed data centers with advanced replication mechanisms and partitioning of data it can be accessed from anywhere efficiently. Uh, at the same time, workflows are sort of a natural fit here because the data that the workflow represents are always uniquely identified that can be easily uh, represented or uh, <clears throat> implemented as a partition key of the Cassandra uh, table. And with that, it can enable a very efficient uh, access to the data through the uh, to the queries defined based on the requirements of the workloads itself. So uh, let's quickly take a look at what is actually to be stored. First and foremost is the workload instance state, right? So where the instance is at given point in time. Uh, workload instances are uh, going into so-called wait states. That means there is no more work to be done at this point in time. And there is a need to wait for an external trigger. And this external trigger can be a human actor completing a task, or it could be an external system either directly calling the service API or uh, incoming message, or even the time-based activity that will just expire and call the uh, workload instance to resume. The next thing that is of pretty much the same importance is the workload instance data. And the workload instance data represents the complete context of the workload instance. That is uh, to make sure the when resumed, instance can have a complete context in its execution to be able to properly function and continue with the state uh, with the uh, following activities. Lastly, taking a, a advantage of uh, Apache Cassandra uh, recommended design principle, that is the query-based design, data handled by workload instance can be actually easily denormalized into additional tables uh, that will fit the application usage scenarios to make sure that the data is uh, fetched efficiently, it can provide additional views of uh, on top of the data and so on and so forth. So it's all, uh, it's all about to uh, satisfy the requirements, plus uh, satisfy require business requirements to be able to efficiently work on this uh, to achieve the business goal. So uh, knowing what needs to be stored, let's take a look at what actually happens behind the scenes to actually use the uh, Apache Cassandra as the data store for workload data. So at the beginning, we said that the workload uh, definition is kind of a blueprint. And when it comes to storage, it actually expands on this idea. So each workload definition based on its identifier and version has dedicated table in Apache Cassandra key space. This uh, simply allows us to keep instances of the same time collocated in a single place and make the management of it simple. The table is uh, responsible for keeping the runtime state of the instance and should be as small as possible, meaning that it should contain the minimal set of information to resume the execution of, uh, of the workflow instance. 
uh, at the same time the data that are stored are stored as part of this uh, table as well and stored in a blob uh, is a in a binary format that makes it compact and not easily readable or directly readable plus uh, it enables us to enforce the security requirements like uh, for instance uh, encryption of the data both in transit and at rest so we can have a way more secure uh, data because it can be a sensitive data there as well and to be able to look up uh, instances by additional attributes uh, and those are called the tags so you can put not just the identifier but you can have a, a, a freely defined number of tags that can be used for correlation purposes as well so for instance even incoming message comes in that might not be directly uh, related to the identifier of the process uh, of the workflow instance it can still be matched based on a certain tax and uh, depending on the logic correlation logic to extract uh, information from the message as well so uh, having that in mind and the theory uh, explained very quickly let's explore uh, an implementation this is what i mentioned at the very beginning the, the automatic project that is a uh, open source worker toolkit to build the uh, business focused uh, services and functions I'm going to use that today for the demonstration. Uh, and Automatica comes with the support for Apache Cassandra as the primary data store. And it will uh, provide pretty much everything that requires to run. Obviously, it might require certain uh, amount of uh, tuning to make sure that it fits all the requirements. Uh, but the basics are provided out of the box. Uh, so it will create a table for each workflow definition. It will as well create a secondary indexes if they are required uh, for execution. And it will create a table for keeping track the time-based operations. So those are the so-called timers. If there are timers inside the uh, work on definition, they will be persisted inside the Cassandra as well. So uh, I think it's enough of theory and talking. So let's take a quick look at what can uh, what can we do with the workloads and how they can actually persist data inside the Apache Cassandra? So for today's demo, I selected uh, handling support incidents use case. That is quite a nice fit for the data anywhere concept that uh, sort of maps into a workflow logic and allows us to uh, apply the principles of the follow the sun uh, from the support uh, point of view. So we have different support teams handling the incidents. Uh, uh, following the, the sun to make sure that it's resolved as soon as possible. So before jumping into the uh, actual project and uh, the infrastructure behind it, uh, let's just uh, list out a few of the main uh, requirements for the service. So first and foremost, users can report incidents around the globe. Uh, support teams are geographically distributed to make sure that they can uh, provide the support 24-7. And support teams monitor incoming uh, requests to look at uh, the, uh, the, the incidents to be able to uh, classify them, assign properly the, the support to the working group, request additional information if needed, uh, manage the state of the uh, cases, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, what is uh, quite important and, and interesting as well, to enable collaboration between the uh, incident report and the support teams, uh, both uh, sites can uh, add comments at pretty much any time. So this is uh, the, the support case handling as a workflow definition. So looking at very quickly at the diagram, which is now modeled in BPMN, Business Process Modeling and Notation, can be uh, easy to uh, look at because it's, I think, quite familiar for pretty much anyone uh, as it represents sort of a flowchart. It has obviously a certain uh, semantic and concept behind certain uh, those all the nodes, but to be able to follow uh, the business logic of, of the workflow, it's relatively easy. You can already spot that there are one main path that uh, goes from here when the new incident comes that is going to be classified, uh, assigning support team, notifying the reporter, and it goes then into both uh, waiting states one is waiting for on a condition meaning that if the status change it will complete if the status change to close then it will simply complete the case so it can be closed manually at the same time there are two alternative path alternative paths one is to add comments and those represents uh, ad hoc operations so to say 
So you can add as many comments as uh, is required and both report and support team can add that. Plus we have the reassign support team so it, it can be reassigned at uh, uh, any time as well. Uh, lastly, I wanted to bring uh, attention to the data concepts here. Uh, so we have the data object that represents data of the worker. And depending on the type of the data, they can be classified differently, like the inputs, output, internal data, and so on. So from the Cassandra perspective, or from the storage perspective, this is how it will look like. Based on the information uh, described at the uh, previous slides, what is stored and how it's stored. Here we have uh, a two types of information. One is the table, it's called incident. And that table is responsible for keeping information about the workload instances. So, so this is completely managed by the workload engine. And it is optimized to store as little information as possible to make sure it's efficient and can be uh, uh, <coughs> fetched efficiently based on the partition key. Those two additional tables are the denormalized views to make sure that can be looked at from uh, different angles uh, on top of the workload data. So those are kept in sync based on the mechanism called uh, event publishing. So as soon as the uh, workload engine is done with the work, it allows to capture information of the execution of the uh, of, of the particular execution unit, and then uh, denormalize that into two tables incidents uh, by reporters. So that is optimized uh, for uh, for the uh, reporters, and incident by support team. The support team is similar to is optimized to uh, get information from the support team point of view. All right, so that uh, leads us to the place where we can actually see it in action. So let me start with going quickly through the uh, project itself, uh, the support uh, incidents handling. So it's exact same model of the uh, of the workflow. And different uh, service tasks are responsible for performing operations. So here, for instance, we have the classified incidents. So we can take a look quickly at it. It's a relatively simple logic, uh, but we have with the concept of the priority companies and obviously the Apache is a, a priority company. So as soon as we receive incidents from uh, Apache as a company, we'll flag it as severity origin. So it will be handled with priority. Uh, so those are the ways you can uh, define your uh, services uh, that are invoked as part of the workflow definition. When it comes to the data model, it's again a simple uh, POJOS that represent the data, nothing really complex. But the most important part is that, as you can see, there is not much of the service itself, meaning that there is no REST APIs build and so on and so forth. This is all done uh, by the uh, workflow uh, toolkit that will create everything based on the definition. And lastly, what I mentioned about the event publisher, so this is the logic that is actually extracting based on the incoming uh, workflow inst instance information and populates the data inside uh, Cassandra. So with that quick look at the project, let's get started and just create a container of that uh, project, of that service. So it will quickly build up. In the meantime, we can just log into our Cassandra. And we will use the automatic copy space. Oh, sorry. All right, and we just can look at describe tables. So here we have uh, all those tables I mentioned in the presentation. So incident is the one managed by the uh, work on engine. So here we have the instance ID, we have the content, which is the, the binary content, we have the, the status, and we have the tags as well. Plus, if we look, for instance, at this one, and just look here, so we have a bit more information, so we denormalize the, the data, because inside the uh, managed by the workflow engine, there is not much data we can easily fetch. So it's purely optimized for the workflow engine to perform its work, but it's not really readable or query friendly, so to say. So that's why we have those additional 
tables that uh, comes with information that is relevant for a particular user scenario. So here we have our uh, service build. So let's run it. And if it goes here, so we just start that. And let me just go quickly here. So first we can look at the interface of our service. So this is all built out of the workflow definition. We have the information, for instance, that uh, if you want to create new instances of the incidents, here's our data model. We can easily try it out that we are going to do that in a second. Uh, then we have the other uh, operations that allow, allows us to work on it. So this represents the user task, the wait state. Here we have the alternative path to change the assignee or to add comments and manage tags, the tags and tasks as well. So let's create a new instance. So let's say that uh, login pro with HR system. So it's, let's say it's here. Okay. And And my name so is and we say I want to have a top severity. And keep in mind that it is uh, managed by the business logic, so it will assign uh, or classify it on its own based on the information. So we have the title, login problems. All right, an instance is created. So we have, as you can see, the ID is the generated support number, a case number. And we can look at additional information that comes out of the box as well. So it's like a management interface that, again, loads, uh, uses the Apache Cassandra underneath to fetch all the information. So we can see here, based on the information we created, we have the support uh, ticket. We have the information about the company and information about the user. We can look at the details as well. This is where we can actually see where the workflow instance currently is. So it, it's waiting on those two things and the data model of it itself, including the state. So that how it looks like from the workflow perspective, but let's take a look at how it actually looks like from the point of view. So we can take a look um, and sense by order. So here we have the information from the reporter point of view. Uh, we can do the same from the support team. As you can see, the data differs slightly. Uh, again, it's a very simple use case, so you, you won't see that much of a difference. But again, it is a lot, it gives you the possibility to uh, track properly the information, what happens, where it happens, and so on and so forth. As you can see in the reporter space, we have the number of comments. So we can actually work with the uh, instance itself. So we can easily get the, okay, let's grab the support case number, the incident ID, and we simply just go and work on the comments. So we can just add here and it's like, it's in the progress. And it's, me so we can just add that here and if we look back at our reporter we already have the number one comment and we can look from here as well again we have the information there as well but an interesting part is uh, i said that the uh, apache is a, a prioritized company so we can actually create another case and this time it will be the same problem, but we will, and it's John, and it's John. So we can just submit that. It assigns different case number. And if we look here from the reporter point of view, and you can see the severity is actually directly set to urgent based on the prioritization of it. We can do the queries based on the, Uh, here we can filter that as well because it's part of the partition key. So it's again efficient uh, in terms of fetching data. 
And last that I would like to show is that if we use that new support number and just go to comments again, and this time it will be John says, all good case can be closed. And here is an interesting feature is that uh, because uh, the workable instance actually is waiting on the conditional event, meaning that it can react to changes to the data itself. Here we have a logic that as soon as the comment includes information about the state of it, so for instance, someone the, expects it to, to be closed. So for instance, it has a keyword close in it, it will automatically close the instance. And if we look at the information here, the status is updated to close immediately. And if we go back to our management and look at the active instances, we don't have the, the Apache company ticket anymore. And it is in the completed ones. And we can directly see the state of it, which paths were taken to lead to the completion of the case. So that allows us to efficiently distribute the information managed by workloads because it all resides in Cassandra. Cassandra is the primary data store for the workflow data and it's uh, denormalized views. So with that, I will switch back to the slides uh, as soon as I find it. All right, so to quickly recap what I showed today was What's the advantages of using Cassandra for workloads? Uh, first and foremost, it is actually due to the highly available and fault-tolerant data storage that Apache Cassandra comes with. And that allows us to replicate the workload instance data with pretty much not much of an effort. Obviously, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind while doing this, and I will just tackle that in a second. But at the same time, geographically distributed setup of the cluster enabled data anywhere approach, meaning that in case of this uh, de demonstration, the use case of the support incident, we can easily have the follow the sun approach where we have a lot of uh, people involved around the globe and then picking up the work where the previous team left off. So it's easy because we can distribute that based on the setup of our cluster uh, and the rings. And the data centers, it allows us to fine tune all the requirements that we have for accessing it from the business perspective. What is as well important is that the main parts that drive the setup uh, are still under your full control, meaning that the how cluster is set up, uh, how data centers are distributed, what's the key space configuration are solely under your control. Even you can go further down and set up the, the tables knowing the, the requirements, the rules that the, the work engine will require, you can still have full control over the table setup as well. Data denormalization helps uh, at building query based design that is completely tailored for the business needs and requirements that the service has. Uh, no shortcuts, no workarounds uh, to fit the framework, the, all given to you to build exactly what is needed at a big scale. And with all the quality of service characteristics you need from both data point of view and execution point of view. And lastly, due to the natural fit of uh, workflow instances and Cassandra storage, based on the partition key, it makes it really easy and possible to make sure that the related data are co-located. Co For instance, the report and incidents are part of the same partition and those can be fetched efficiently because usually we know that the, the same reporter will have access to the, the complete data set. So that is how we can group things together as well. So I, I said as well that uh, so far it was all looking good and so on and so forth, but you know it's, it's too good to be true. So there are certain possible pain points and options to address them. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up, even though it's, uh, it's already sort of addressed or so there is an option to address it, but it's the too many tombstones. And that is problematic because the workload engines are optimized to work on things that are active, meaning the things that can change and the workload engine needs to uh, react to that. But it does not really care that much on the instances that are completed. So in case of uh, frequent deletions, uh, that can uh, 
decrease the number of dump zones and then have a negative impact on the cluster itself. So the approach here, and this is what was presented at the demonstration, is even though the case was closed, uh, the instance is still inside the Cassandra table space or the, the key space and table. It is just updating the status. So it will be kind of looked from the workload perspective as a history data and not the uh, active data. So that will allow us to easily get through that part. And then the next thing is uh, that is in the, uh, right now under investigation is the secondary indexes that might not be fast enough or good enough. Obviously, it will depend on the amount of data and the volume of data, but it needs to be uh, kept an eye on uh, especially when it comes to the tags and uh, because that tags are set uh, of strings uh, or text uh, and then we have the status as well so those things need to be uh, fine-tuned keep an eye on and to make sure that this is the most efficient one although it might uh, in the future change that it will be on a separate table rather than uh, using the secondary indexes uh, as well, we are looking at the uh, uh, new features of, uh, of Cassandra 4 uh, and the uh, upcoming work around, the, uh, around this area. Uh, so we wanted to be uh, on, on our toes to make sure that we use the best, uh, best feature fitting that requirements. And uh, at the end is the size limit of a column value. So as I mentioned, the data uh, and the state and the data themselves are represented in a column uh, of type blob. So there are a certain amount of data that you can put there, or you should not put there more than X number of, of data. So it's important to keep an eye when you design your workflows as well. So for instance, if you have a workflow that deals with document approvals or reviews, for instance, it would not be wise to keep the documents as part of the workflow in, in, in the data itself, because the most likely it will be way too big. So it's better to uh, <clears throat> delegate that responsibility to, to for instance, uh, a document management system. Uh, even though there are certain limits or certain pain points, I think uh, the, uh, the advantages gained from using Apache Cassandra as a storage for workloads outweighs it significantly. And there are still uh, uh, mitigations that can be easily uh, uh, addressing, um, can easily address the, the pain points. So if you want to automate at scale, I think Apache Cassandra is the best candidate to make it happen. And with that, uh, I'm finishing up the presentation. So in case you want to know more, you can get in touch uh, on Twitter with me and uh, have a few links uh, if you want to read up more about the, the project itself or get a bit of details uh, on workloads uh, powered by Cassandra. So here we have the QR code as well uh, that uh, takes you directly to the Automatico uh, landing page. So feel free to, to look at that and reach out if you have any questions or comments. And with that, I'll open up for questions. So thanks for listening. I can see there's one question in chat. Let me just read that through. Wouldn't Cassandra fall short if we have workload stages that share the same workflow instance data for eventual consistency? Yes, it could be to some degree an, uh, a problem, uh, but it depends on how uh, those shared state or the activities that uh, run in parallel are invoked. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, the workload engine can uh, secure the concurrent update the instance, and there are different strategies to do so. One is keeping track of the version of the uh, element being updated, and the other one is uh, simply locking elements as well. So in, depending on both design of the workflow and design of your uh, infrastructure, that might be uh, an issue or it might not be an issue. All right, that I think is the only question from the chat. I don't know if I answer it or not, uh, but feel free to reach out. I'll be hanging around here uh, for a while. So again, thanks a lot.